My name is Jason Caldwell, and um, I'm going to tell you some stories today. I'm going to tell you some personal stories. And um, the company that I, I founded, and sorry, that, that was alluded to, is Latitude 35, and it's a leadership development company. So we do leadership training courses for corporations like yourself and business schools all over the world. And that matters because I've actually been working with Crawford for the last couple of years through, as you heard, Emory's executive education department. And so I do feel this wasn't just, they didn't just pluck me out of some speaker's bureau or something like that. Um, I do feel that I know this company well. I'm getting to know you guys even better. And then this is, um, this is special for me to be here today. So I, I'm looking forward to being able to share these stories. Um, the second part of our company though, which is what I'm actually going to be talking about today, is we developed a racing team. So um, I, I played baseball, baseball fans here? Okay, good, there we go, all right. Um, I played baseball my, my entire life. I played in college as well. I played for the San Francisco Angels uh, for a couple years, but I, I injured my elbow in my last year of eligibility in college. And so that's how I got into rowing. The rowing coach found me and I started rowing in college, was lucky enough to be invited to an Olympic training team after that, and so on and so forth. When I started this leadership development company and we started to train organizations, one thing I didn't want to be was a company that just simply said, hey, survey, show this, and study, show that. We wanted to be a company that went out, led teams, built teams, made mistakes, learned from those mistakes, and were able to share all that experience with people such as yourself. That's what today is gonna to be about. So we did, we put together an adventure racing team. So that's the second arm of our company. And so each year, we enter in one big epic world record attempt or race, and we put the team together, um, we train, and then we go in and try to do this race. And as of now, um, until I can no longer physically do it, or my wife divorces me, um, I'm, I'm, part of, I'm part of those teams. So I put those teams together. To give you an example, um, in 2015, we put a team together to enter what many can say is the, the toughest race in the world. It's a 3,000 mile rowing race across the Atlantic Ocean that starts in, um, in the Canary Islands off the coast of West Africa and goes those 3,000 miles southwest to Antigua. In fact, this picture right here, which I'm gonna talk a lot about, is the result of that finish. That's the finish line after um, what would be 51 days out at sea. Um, the, second, the next year after that, in 2016, we re-entered the race because we didn't, we didn't win that race and we wanted to put a new team together, so we did. We re-entered the race. I raced it again with a new team and not only did we win the race that year in 2017, but we also broke the 13-year world record as the fastest team to ever row across the Atlantic Ocean. The next year after that, we decided to trek across the oldest desert in the world, which is in southwestern Africa, unassisted. We, we packed our own food, we, we dug for water, um, I got stalked by a lion for 24 hours. Um, that's another story that we won't, unfortunately won't be able to get in today, and we were able to successfully do that, so on and so forth. And this year, in fact, June 4th of this year, we will um, row in a rowing race from San Francisco to Hawaii, 2,500 miles, and, um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. All these things, of course, so, so very proud of, so excited to be able to bring those experiences to our, our leadership programs. Um, but when preparing for today, and knowing that I only have um, a little bit of time, trying to select a story, I am going to tell one specific story in detail about the first year that we rode across the Atlantic, the year that we did not only not break a world record, but didn't even win the race, a year that we actually took 11th place. This is the story that I'm gonna tell, and then I'm gonna show you, roll that into how that actually transformed into one year later, breaking the world record. So um, before I start telling the story, I need to give some context. I'm pretty sure there's not a whole lot of um, ocean rowers in the room right now. So this is an ocean rowing boat. This is what it looks like. Um, and this is at the finish line after, like I said, 3,000 miles and 51 days. Um, to give you a little bit of print, we all know what the Atlantic looks like, but there's, there's the route. It starts there. You can see off the coast of West Africa, that's the start line, and it goes to Antigua in the Caribbean. So that's, that's the actual the distance that we covered. Now this race is considered to be, by many, the most difficult race in the world for, for two very specific reasons. The first one is probably the more obvious one, and that's the physicality of this race. So um, here's a closer picture of the boat as well. So there was, in our first year, 26 teams representing countries from around the world, charities, corporations, 
all this stuff. And to just be able to represent your, your sponsors or your charities or your country and be able to get to the start line and make it to the finish line is an incredible, incredible achievement. But if you were like our team that put this team together that wants to win the race and perhaps even set a national or world record, you must keep this boat moving the entire time. So there's, this is a four-person race. You see three people, one person's in the cabin. Normally in this boat, you've got two people rowing at any given time, and you've got two people resting, all right? And you are rotating two hours on, two hours off, 24 hours a day, throughout the entire crossing, day and night. So like I said in that first picture, that was after 51 days of a minimum of, as an individual, 12 hours of rowing. However, in a picture like this that you see as we're pushing in that second race to break the world record, which we weren't sure we were going to be able to do, you have to put a third person in, in the third rowing seat. There's actually three rowing seats there, and you can see I'm in the middle there. In which case, instead of two hours on, two hours of rest, you've got two hours of rowing and only 40 minutes of rest. And you're rotating that. So your 12-hour rowing day as an individual becomes an 18-hour rowing day. So I lost 40 pounds in, in both those races. So you, you can imagine just the physicality alone of this race is one of the reasons it becomes such a difficult, difficult race. Now the other reason is the logistics, something that this group knows a lot about. Logistics make this race very difficult. This is a unassisted rowing race, meaning that when you leave, when your crew, your boat, leaves the start line out of the Canary Islands, you cannot take anything from another boat. There is no sailboat following you. It is just you and your boat and your crew by yourself throughout the entire crossing. That means you have to have the food in there that you're gonna bring, which for, uh, we, I know we've got some military personnel in here, that's usually freeze-dried food, dehydrated food that you're adding, that's 80% of your food. The other 20% is in the form of usually nuts, dried fruit, protein bars, things that don't spoil. That's your food. Your water is being desalinated, it's being sucked up by a hole in the boat and sent through a high-pressured carbon fiber chamber, and that's your drinking water. Everything on this boat you need. This is what, you don't get off on it. There's, there's, there's two cabins. You can see the larger one there, the door is like kind of open. That's, that's the big roomy cabin where two people my size can fit relatively uncomfortably side by side. And then there's a smaller cabin where it says the American Spirit. That cabin's so small, the door, you have to literally crawl into it and then you close it and it's kind of just on top of you like that. And there's a little hole underneath the deck of the boat where your feet go so you can sleep and actually be spread out all the way. So that's the two places that you go when you're not rowing. Inside this smaller cabin are your, your comms, your communications. You've got your sat phones. You've got your VHF radios. You've got your chart plotter for navigation. You've got what's called an auto helm that if you've got enough power, it will actually hold your bearings so you don't have to worry about steering while you row. And all of those things are being powered by two very small solar panels, one that you can kind of see on the stern cabin there and one that's just slightly larger on the bow cabin. So with all this, if something breaks out there, you and your team must learn to fix it. If it can't be fixed, you're going to have to learn to live without it. If it can't be lived without, that's when you're going to be rescued at sea, which happens to one or more boats every year. And this race is held every year since 1996. So this is the scenario that I chose to get involved in in 2013 when I wanted to put a team together to race this race for the 2015 race. It takes about two years to get everything together, to get sponsorship together, it's a very expensive race, to get your boat, to train your team, all this kind of stuff, all these certification classes, and so that's what we were doing, and I started putting the team together. So, now as a, a rower in college, and a, the road on Olympic training team, I knew um, some of the country's best rowers. In fact, at, at 6'4", 200 pounds, which is what I'm at, I was the shortest and lightest guy on, on the rowing team. So I was a, I'm a very small guy for rowing. And I was looking forward to, once again, being that small individual. So I start to go try to build this team. The first person I get is a guy here by the name of Nick Kahn. Now, Nick and I never rode with each other, but we rode against one another for years. And we always respected each other um, as competitors. He was one of the most tenacious athletes I'd ever met in my life. And we became friends over the course of years, even though we never rode together. 
And we always wanted to do something. And so he was one of the first names that I thought about. I called him. I told him what I was trying to do. He was obviously very intrigued. We started trading our information back. And before I knew it, within a couple weeks, he had committed as the second person on this team. Now, the next person that we got is on the far right there of your screen by the name of Greg Wood. Now, Greg, as you can see from the picture, not the biggest person, but what I had known about Greg, knowing him for the past handful of years, and Nick knew him as well, is that Greg had utility. He's a problem solver. He's very clever. And as we started to research this race and what was needed in a team, we realized that Greg was going to be somebody that we absolutely needed. He was going to be able to fix those problems out there. And so he was living in Houston at the time, running a boathouse there. We flew down, had the conversation with him. After a long weekend, he had committed as that third teammate. And then we're struggling for the next about month or two to find that last, that last teammate. Now, like I said, I know all these great athletes, these great rowers, but I've been retired from rowing for a handful of years at this point. People have gone off, gotten careers, gotten families. The opportunity cost for not only just crossing this ocean, but training for the next two years had, had greatly risen. So it was really difficult to find. And Tom, the only person I haven't mentioned here, Tom and I are good friends. In fact, some of the people that, that have been at our program know Tom. And to look at Tom, he, he, he rode, but he wasn't a great athlete. He's tall, but he's very skinny. And he's one of my, one of my good friends, was in my wedding, and we worked together. And we travel as a result of all our work. We're always in airports together. And he's kind of helping me with setting this whole thing up. When he surprises me one evening, when we're at an airport flying home after a long day, by telling me that he'd like to be considered as that fourth and final teammate. Now, I know Tom well. I know what he can do and what he can't do. And so I'm, as he's kind of talking, I'm kind of getting ready to let this guy down easy. He's a good friend of mine, but this is not the person that I want as the fourth teammate. But then he tells me why he wants to be on the team, his why. And if you know me and if you've been through any of my programs, you know that this is something that I harp on because I think it is so important. It's going to come back through this story. He tells me his why. Now, this is what he tells me, a story that I had heard many times because he's a good friend of mine, but never listened to the way that I had listened to at the airport that evening. So this is, this is Tom's story. Tom grew up in Azerbaijan, Soviet-era Russia, okay? Um, just outside of the capital, capital of Baku in the Caspian Sea. And he had a nice childhood growing up with his mom and his younger brother. However, he experienced things that I, growing up in the San Francisco Bay Area, certainly had never experienced. Things like standing in food, or standing in line for food during bouts of massive inflation. Other things like having to hustle indoors when tanks and other military vehicles were literally rolling down his neighborhood streets. And the whole time that those things were happening, he was having those experiences, he always wanted to move to the United States. That was his dream. He begged his mom to get him an English tutor early on, learned English, got his hands on anything made in the U.S., watched all the classic late 80s, early 90s sitcom, Seinfeld, Full House, I'm sure Baywatch, if we're being honest. And then one year, in 2002, he got his wish. They won a green card lottery, enabled himself, his mom, and his younger brother to move to the United States. They got a little two-bedroom apartment just outside of Philadelphia. Tom started washing cars at a Mercedes dealership to make rent while going to university, University of Delaware. His brother was going to high school, and his mom, who was a doctor in Baku, was now going back to school to be a registered nurse, and that was their lives. Fast forward to this day in 2013, this evening that we're at the airport that he's telling me this story, and things have dramatically changed for the better. He's got a great job, a great career. His brother not only graduated from high school, but graduated with a degree in finance, getting married, child on the way. Mom's now a nurse practitioner in Philadelphia, also getting remarried. And he tells me that night, he says, I want a chance to represent the country that gave me all of that. Now, as you might have noticed, we live in a politically tumultuous landscape these days. I don't really care which side of the fence you land on, but 
to have the American dream, something that I can tell you right now I've taken for granted many, many times, to be given that dream and to want to represent that country that gave that to you, that's a pretty strong why. And at this moment, I'm embarrassed to say as someone who has taught leadership at this point for a decade already, I'm realizing something for the first time. That is, there is a difference between the best people and the right people. Tom, on paper, is not the best person to be on this team. He's tall, but he's skinny. He doesn't have a lot of muscle. He has trouble putting weight on. He was a good rower, but not a great one. But after that story, listening to that why, I realized that he is absolutely the right person for this team. And we committed right there to be the fourth and final teammate. And so here we have our team. We spend the next year and a half getting ready, training for this, getting our sponsorship together, training, taking certification classes, navigating at sea, navigating at night, other morbid things like what to do if there's a death at sea, obviously very dangerous crossing what we're about to do. And we're building this thing up, and before we knew it, it was December of 2015, and we report to the Canary Islands, which for those of you that have not been there, it's beautiful islands off the coast of West Africa. They're Spanish islands. And we're on the second smallest island there, a small little island called La Gomera, actually the same island that Christopher Columbus left from in 1492 when he made his voyage. That's where we're at. There's 26 teams representing countries from around the world. And you're there for two weeks. In the first week, your boat's not even on the water. It's on dock with all the other boats, and you are doing what's called going through a scrutineering process. So you have to be checked out by the doctors, and once they've cleared you and all your teammates, then the officials come out, they make you take everything that you're gonna be taking out of the boat, and you put it on a huge tarp that would fill up the front of this room right here. You lay everything out, all your food rations, all your equipment, you show that you know how to use it, that it works, and then once they've cleared you, you put all of the stuff back in the boat, they launch your boat on the water, and for that second week that you're there before the race starts, you do what's called trimming the boat. You distribute the weight evenly so that you know, and you hear some pictures of us. Then you start practicing out there. Obviously, you've practiced for the last year and a half, but you start working and putting your little, all your little personal kit together, making the transitions on the small boat, how it's going to work out. Maybe you spend a couple nights on the boat just to get yourself ready. And so that's what we were doing. That's absolutely all the things that we were doing and we were getting ready along with the other 25 teams that were out there. And then on December 20th, the race starts. Most people think that are going out this, that we are going to win this race. I'm gonna tell you that right now. Most people do. We are well-funded, we're well-organized, we're full of athletic rowers. Most of the other teammates, our teams that are out there are not rowers, they're adventurers, they're sailors that while we were spending our time learning about the ocean, they were spending their time just learning how to row. So we represented this kind of new generation of this road. So everyone said, you know, that's a team that's gonna win out there. But even from the first day, as the race starts on December 20th of 2015, things start to go downhill for us. Two things especially start to happen that are devastating for our team personally. The first thing, is that Nick, my big, strong, remember, tenacious athlete, the guy that I had rode against for years and respected, he starts to get seasick. So, has anyone here been seasick, by the way? I'm sure by the groans that we've got. Okay, yeah, we've got a fair amount of hands there. So for those of you that have been seasick, you know that it is one of the most awful, debilitating feelings that you could ever have. And what's going on with seasickness, by the way, is that the fluid in your brain isn't matching up with what your eyes are actually seeing as the boat is going up and down. And that misalignment is causing you to be very, very ill. And there's only two ways to get rid of seasickness. One is to you know, get off the boat, which wasn't an option for us. And the other one is to literally just ride it out. And whether it takes you one day, three days, five days, eventually that, e this, th that equilibrium will right itself and you'll start to feel better. And everybody goes through a variation of seasickness, but it's genetic of how it's gonna hit you. But no one was getting hit harder than Nick, who went from on day one, rowing his two hours on, two hours off, to day two, missing a shift here or there that we were trying to make up for. By day three, completely out. 
inside this larger cabin here, getting sick, throwing up six, seven times a day, and not rowing at all. In fact, without sounding too dramatic, it got so bad as day went from day three to day four to day five that he started to hallucinate, talking to his fiance and his parents who obviously weren't there, and at one point even suggesting to himself and us that he'd rather just get out of the boat and swim home. That's how desperate this man was getting. That was the first thing that was happening. The second thing that was happening was that Greg, there on the far right, the guy with a lot of utility, the fixer, the clever individual, he was going through a deterioration of his own, but it wasn't physical. It was a mental and emotional deterioration. Now, I'm sure you can imagine right now, this is an incredibly difficult journey, and while it's certainly difficult physical, the mental and emotional part is very, very difficult. In fact, we have to take a class, it's mandatory for this race, on shock, on the inevitable shock. Once you leave and the adrenaline wears off, which is pretty much just the first half day of the race, your mind literally cannot wrap itself around what you are about to do. That you, you, you have 3,000 miles before you'll see anything that resembles your life. And everybody goes through that shock in different ways. But for Greg, it manifested itself in a very dangerous way. He went from being quiet and reclusive on day one. Then on day two, he started getting abrasive and argumentative. Everything that somebody said, he had something to snap back at. By, three and, by day three and four, the same days that Nick was no longer rowing, to his credit, although he was still rowing, he was now getting to be threatening, to be violent, and saying things that the team, the teammates, his teammates in the boat, were trying to kill him. So that's what was happening with our team as the first week of this race is starting to unfold itself. And we're still in about fourth or fifth place at this time, even without one of our strongest rowers, if you can believe it. And you can follow this race on an app. There's a, you can follow the boats on every four hours and updates. And so we, um, we can't see it, but we have a land manager that we call, and she would give us the update at where we are. But on day five, everything finally comes to a head. I'm rowing my shift. It's late afternoon. I finish my shift, and every every few hours, I open up the cabin door and I kind of try to help Nick out, try to get him some water, try to get him to eat some food, help him use the bathroom. And throughout the day, I'm calling the officials that are at the start line and asking them, you know, we've got a big medic bag. And they said, well, give him this, this medicine, wait 15 minutes, followed by water and some food. Now he threw that up. What's next? We'll try this. And all these different combinations as those first five days were unfolding and nothing was helping. He was getting worse and worse and worse. But finally on this day, as I opened the cabin door to kind of coax him out to help him try to eat some food, I find that he's, he's, he's shaking, he's convulsing. And I'm, of course, I'm very scared. And so I kind of, I duck into that, that cabin there and I try to kind of try to help him up. And as I do, I realize on his back, he's got all these sores, which are essentially like bed sores that have been kind of expedited as a result of having salt all over our bodies and, and he doesn't have any clothes on and the boat rocking so much, it's just been wearing into his skin. And so now we're very, very scared and we get him to come to and we, we try to get some water in him. And after we get him comfortable, I go and get the sat phone and I call the doctors and I let them know what I just told you. And they say, okay, that's it. This is now life-threatening. He needs to be he needs to be evacuated. He needs to get an IV in him. He, he's so severely dehydrated, he needs to get to a hospital. And so I said, okay, well, what does that look like? They said, we're going to leave immediately to start sailing out to you for the evacuation, but it's going to take two to two and a half days at least for us to get out to you. For what we have done in almost a week is going to take them, a sailboat, that long, because there's no other way. With all the technology we have, you can't land a plane in the middle of the ocean. You can't, a helicopter won't make it there and back. They're going to sail and then pick them up and take them to the Verde Islands, which is the closest landmass of the hospital. And at this, at this point, and if I'm being completely honest, and this is a personal story, like I said, the first thought I have in my head is we're not going to win this race. And I, it sounds selfish, and it is. But as somebody who's competitive and is pushing this thing, I've been dreaming about this for two, two years, I realized that we're not going to be able to just stay where we are because that's what they're asking us to do. We have to anchor for the next two to two and a half days. By the way, an anchor is, I don't have an anchor with 30,000 foot rope I'm deploying to the bottom of the sea. It's essentially a big parachute that you deploy on a long line and it fills up with water and acts as a drag, so to speak. 
And that's what the doctors were asking us to deploy because they didn't want to chase us. We needed to stay in one spot. Now the problem with this anchor is that, as you can see when you're around the islands, there's just little waves. You can kind of see them coming over the boat at times. But once you clear the island chain, which took us the first day of this race, those waves go from five foot, 10, 20, 30, and at one point we saw 40 foot undulating huge walls of water so just kind of picture this ceiling as being a wall of water coming at you and your boat that goes up it and literally surfs down. And I know that they were larger than 30 feet because this boat is 30 feet and our boat would be on the wave surfing down, which was of course exacerbating that seasickness. So now by setting this land anchor, these waves that we are going up and surfing down were, were gonna be threatening to crash down on us. But this is what we need to do. We deploy the anchor. We get Nick to where he's comfortable. We tell him what's happening, that he's going to be taken off in a couple days. And we start to literally batten down the hatches and get ready for a very, very long and, and, and dangerous couple days as we're being thrown around the radius of this anchor. And as the sun's kind of going down at that moment, and we're getting everything settled, Greg comes up to me. I mean, it doesn't come up to me. It's a 30-foot boat. He just looks at me. But, <laughs> but Greg looks at me and says, just so you know, when the boat gets here, I'm leaving too. Now, it's safe to say at this part of the story, I don't like Greg a whole lot, okay? <laughs> we, are, we are not getting along, to say, to say the least. However, I'm also fully aware that we absolutely 100% need this guy to finish this race. This boat, by the way, is a British-made boat by a British sail sailing company that makes ocean rowing boats now called a Rannick. It's called an R45, called an R45 because it's meant to be rowed with four or five people. Never in the history of this boat has it crossed the Atlantic or any other ocean with less than four people. Not three, and certainly if Greg leaves, not two. So I ask him to think about it. He agrees that he'll take the night to think about it. We're not going anywhere anyway. The sun goes down. It's now too dangerous to be on the deck of the boat because we're harnessed in, but we're getting thrown around. We all have to get into the cabins. Tom gets in the bigger cabin with Nick, who's very sick, and I get in, of course, with my, my new best friend, Greg, and the small one, and I'm literally sleeping on top of them. It's very uncomfortable. And we have a very tough night. We get through it. I mean, you can hear the waves bashing against the boat. It sounds like the boat's going to break apart at any time, but it doesn't. Sun comes up. I crawl out of that cabin. Greg unfolds himself right after me, and I look at him, and we're on the deck. The boat harnessed in. Sun's coming. I said, what's it going to be? And I'll never forget the words he used. He says, I'm going to run, which I always found to be such an odd choice of phrase for I'm going to quit this team. Remember, with relation to this race, he's healthy, the boat is in good shape, but he says, if I stay here, you guys and this boat are going to kill me. That's what he said. So I realized at that point that he's gone. But now I need to have a conversation with Tom. Tom, who doesn't even know that Greg's considering leaving when Nick gets off the boat, gets rescued, because I figured I didn't want to worry him unless I knew for sure, but now I know. So I knock on that cabin door. I ask him to come out. He come, he's not looking great. He spent a whole night inside with a very, very sick individual that he was taking care of. He harnesses in with me outside, and I tell him what I just told you. I say, just so you know, when, Greg, or when Nick goes, Greg's leaving too. And I'll never forget the choice of words he said in response to that. He said, Jay, talking about me, just come with us. In his mind, it was over, all right? The first thought wasn't, am I staying on this boat? It was, how do I get my crazy asshole friend Jason off this boat, too? It was a very, very real moment. But at this moment, this very, very real moment, I realize I have this very unique opportunity to re-answer that question why for Tom. Now, I think we can all agree that his, his why two years ago in that airport was a pretty strong one, moving. But let me tell you something. 
He is not thinking about that right now. This is not a movie, okay? That why no longer matters. And so I spend the next couple minutes trying to reconvince him. And I'm trying to do all the things that are the reason why I'm staying on this boat, because I've decided I'm staying. And things like personal glory, doing things that something that no one's ever done before. But in the end, those aren't his whys. Those weren't important to him. So he asked for a couple hours to think about it, which I thought was fair. But I'm completely convinced that by the end of it, he's going to have a similar response to what Greg had. He goes back in the cabin. He takes a satellite phone. He makes two phone calls. The first phone call he makes is to his mom, which was nice, because you can see that we're not moving. So he, he calls her and says, you know, essentially he lies to her and says, oh, we're just getting things worked out. Don't worry about us. Puts her mind at ease. The next person he calls is our land manager, a woman by the name of Kim Marion, who some of you also who have been in our classes has, have met before. She had been with us in the team. Every team has to have a land manager, person, person who helps with the stuff, but then, of course, is on land, and you're calling them, talking about weather patterns that you see, and they can look up everything and tell you where you need to go and what bearing. But this time, Tom wasn't calling about bearing. He was saying, this is the situation, and I don't know what to do. And they, they've been good friends for many, many years. She could have said anything you could probably imagine. This is unprecedented circumstances. This isn't your fault. Just do whatever you can to get Jason off this boat. But instead, she chose to remind Tom of a conversation that the two of them had the night before we left for this race. I wasn't even there for it. Sitting at the start line, it's a very, very traditional type of place, old town. And she said, you know, are you scared? about tomorrow. And he said, yeah, I'm, I'm scared. I'm very nervous, but not as much as I thought I would be. And she said, well, why is that? And he said, as long, I always felt that as long as Jason and I were together, like we could overcome anything. And that's what she chose to remind him at this very particular moment. All I know is that two hours later, he crawled out of that cabin. And he said, all right, I'm in which I always say is probably one of the greatest and probably always will be one of the grandest, greatest gestures that anybody's given me, a chance for us to continue this. Two and a half days later, there's a very dramatic evacuation, a story for another time, which I could tell you. At the end of about three and a half, four hours of this evacuation, they get both Nick and Greg off safely, and they start sailing toward the Verde Islands, and it's just Tom and I in our boat. We are now in... 24th place out of 26 teams. We're in third to last. Nobody following this race thinks that we are going to even finish. In fact, a journalist went on record, wrote an article, said it's selfish of them to stay on that boat because what's the point? They're going to have to quit. They're going to have to be rescued. They had a boat there. They didn't take that opportunity. Now maritime law requires that whatever closest vessel that can save them, which is probably an ocean tanker miles and miles away, is going to have to reroute themselves, pick these two kids up, get them out there. It's a waste of resources and money for that company. It's selfish. That's what we were up against. And so we start talking about how we're going to do this that no one thinks we can do. And we decided, are we trying to just prove those people wrong? Or are we still racing? Which doesn't seem like maybe the first thing that you would try to figure out, but that was what we did. We decided we still wanted to race, which meant we were going to have to do the two hours on, two hours off thing still. But instead of having someone to row with, you're going to be on that deck by yourself for two hours. And then you'd rotate and be in the cabin by yourself for two hours. And that was going to be the rotation. So we called the, land, or the duty officer in charge, told them that, we, that the evacuation had happened, and that we were staying. And he, who was a very supportive uh, person in this whole thing, said, look, nobody knows what's going to happen to you. you. You are going to be manhandled by the ocean in that boat that you're in. But, he said, if I'm giving some advice, if you were to get lighter, you don't need 60 days worth of food for four people. There's only two of you now. If you were to get lighter and the wind and the waves and the current happened to be in your favor, you could actually pick up some decent speed. And so that's what we started doing. We started to get lighter. The first thing we did, of course, we threw all of Greg's personal stuff overboard, which was really light. <laughs> all Greg's stuff just floating in the ocean somewhere. And after that, what we did, what really got the weight down, is that we started cutting the dried food bags and emptying the dried food into the ocean. Cutting many bags took us a long time. Until finally, you could see the boat was, was physically, visibly higher in the boat. We felt good for the first time. And we said, okay, and we started. 
We're at this point 600 miles into this 3,000 mile road. We have 2,400 miles left to go. But we feel good until the next thing happens. It actually gets worse. A hurricane slams into the west coast of Africa, a hurricane that had not hit in that location, that part, that region of Africa since 1967, is now slamming into that, the outskirts of which are affecting our boat and the entire fleet. Now the outskirts, which this room certainly knows well, of a hurricane, maybe categorized as a tropical storm, is not as bad. You, you're happy to hear that kind of news when it, when it downgrades to a tropical storm. But when you're in a 30-foot boat in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, I can assure you that a tropical storm is still very bad. And that's when we started seeing the 30 to 40-foot waves. So for the next three days, which are the first three days of, our, of us being by ourselves, we are getting absolutely pummeled by the ocean and the elements. And during the day, remember, you've got three two-hour shifts that are during the day. And, those, and during those shifts, you're out there by yourself, and you see these huge walls of water kind of approaching you because you're rowing. You're going that way, but you're facing backwards. That's how you row. And so you can see this stuff approaching you, and you get ready, and then you go up the wave, or the wave comes underneath you, I should say, and then you desperately, as a rower, try to hold the boat at a 45-degree angle so that you're coming down like, like a surfer would be. You don't want to be sideways because the boat will roll, obviously. And you don't want to go straight down because then you could do what's called hitch pull into the trough of the wave and, and go end over end. And so you try to do it, you navigate, and you're scared, and you finally do it, and then you kind of catch your breath and you get ready and you anticipate the next set coming in. And that what was going on during your three two-hour sessions during the day. But remember, half of this race, which most people don't realize, half of the race is at night. And yeah, sometimes it's a full moon, but more times than not, it's a new moon, or it's a cloudy night, especially in a storm, or the moon doesn't even rise until the morning, in which case you are in complete, utter pitch darkness. So instead of anticipating these waves coming, you're reacting as you feel the boat kind of just pitch up. And you kind of desperately with your oars trying to make sure that the boat doesn't tip while the other person is in the cabin holding on. And so that was what was going on for the first day, into the night, into the day, night, day, and night. Three days of that. I have the last evening shift, which we categorize as the 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. shift. And on that third day, of us being out there by ourselves. I've got about two minutes left of this of my shift. And I don't mind telling you, I want to quit. If I'm being completely honest, I wish I would have gotten off the boat. I wish I did not convince Tom, who I now feel responsible for, to stay on with me. It's 7.58, and I'm just, I'm in my foul weather gear. We've got stress fractured ribs. Everything's falling apart. I'm just going through the motions, just trying to keep it. I'm, I'm getting ready for, for my break. And by the way, for these last three days, you know, we're just kind of ships passing each other in the night. Every two hours, somebody would be coming off the shift, and somebody would be coming on. That was for those couple minutes, we'd talk. You know, the guy coming off the shift would say, hey, you know, storm just passed. I'm, I'm, I'm keeping at 262 degrees. You know, this, it rained on me for the first 45 minutes. And then the guy coming on the shift would normally kind of offer some words of encouragement, some empathy, saying, hey, great job. You know, hang in there, go get some rest. And so, as I'm finishing my last couple minutes, I can hear the creak of the cabin door behind me opening up. It's Tom getting ready for a shift. I'm, I'm looking forward to the only thing at this point I can look forward to, which is these couple words of encouragement. And this is, by the way, this is the story that I, I chose for this, for this day, for you. And so I'm getting ready to, for these words, and this is what he chooses to say. He says, hey, Jay, um, what do you want for breakfast? And I'm like, what the, f I'm so upset. It's a very, very sensitive time. And I need these words. And that was insensitive of him to just ask something like that. This is how I feel. I'm very upset. And so I'm kind of rolling that last 30 seconds and I'm so pissed. And I'm looking behind my shoulder and I'm about to kind of, you know, admonish him for this stupid, silly, insensitive comment. When I realize, actually, I'm starving. <laughs> because in the midst of this night, I, and, and everything that was going on, the chaos, I hadn't eaten anything, maybe a handful of nuts, that was it. And so instead of saying something that I'm sure I would have regretted later, I say, well, I guess you know, I would have the chicken risotto. 
which is one of the flavors of the freeze-dried meals that I particularly liked. And he responds by saying, I think I'll have the spaghetti bolognese, which is also another flavor. These are two guys, by the way, not at an Italian restaurant, but actually in the middle of the ocean having this conversation. And then he falls and says, do you want me to make you some coffee? And I said, yeah, I love coffee. And he says, well, you want me to you know, sprinkle the powdered hazelnut creamer? I said, yeah, what are we even talking about? That's my favorite part. And so he says, I'll make you a deal. He says, if you row the next 10 minutes, which was not lost on me, that was 10 minutes of his shift. He says, I'll make breakfast so that when you do get off the shift, you can just go ahead and ha have breakfast and not have to worry about cooking it and then just go to bed. Now, 10 minutes is a lot to be asking in a man of my situation to be rowing extra 10 minutes. But one thing that we had known about each other is that I hate the cooking, okay? I hate jet boiling the water, trying to make it not spill on you, and then trying to put it in a little packet, and you gotta stir it, and all this. So I don't I wanna do that. I'd much rather put the muscle into the rowing. That's just who, who I am. Whereas Tom, you know, Chef Boyardee over here, he likes cooking. He'd much rather cook than row. He says it's a way for him to escape the reality. He could be cooking in his own kitchen. So I said, okay. And we made that deal. And 13 minutes later, he was done. But here's the deal. Once he said he was done, we did something that we had never done before. Just like this picture. I pulled the oars in, I turned around in my seat, and I faced Tom, just like this picture. Now nobody's rowing. The boat is not making progress towards the finish line. And we have breakfast together. Now, for the last three days, we are scared, and we're alone. We haven't been able to share, so we start talking to each other. We just share our experiences that happened the last three days. For two guys in the same 30-foot boat, we don't, know what, we don't know what the other person's gone through. I tell them, you know what happened to me last night? A flying fish hit me right in the face. Just true. <laughs> flying fish are everywhere, but you don't think about this stuff. And it hit me in the face, and it hurt. And it was still in the boat. And I showed it to him, and he was laughing like you guys are, and, and he kind of shared his experience. And for 30 minutes, that's what we did. We just ate together, and we laughed. And we, we, we had that, that time. And then after that 30 minutes, we put the oars back in the water, and we went into our two-hour session. We said, okay, we're ready to go back. But after that moment, after that morning, something dramatic took place first thing that started happening is that we started going faster. And I don't mean just a little bit faster. Remember, we are in 24th place out of 26 teams with, at this point, probably around 23, 2200 miles to go. No one thinks we're finishing. But not only do we keep going, but we start moving. We're in 24th place, and then we move into 23rd, and then to 22, 21, 20, 19, 18, 17. 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10. And the last day, we fell back down to 11th place. We couldn't quite hold off one of the crews. But over the next 41 days of us being out there, we moved from 24th place and finished in 11th. That was the first thing that happened. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. That's nice. Thank you. That's very nice of you. Um, you know, I was like, get a little emotional sometimes, so I'm sorry. Um, but the second thing that happened was that every morning at 8 o'clock, we had that breakfast. At 8 a.m., I wrote a little extra, he cooked a little more, we pulled the oars in, and we had breakfast, which was obviously, I'm so happy that I at one, at one point took one of those pictures. And sometimes it was nice like this. You can see there's some blue sky, we're able to sit there, and have, have a good time. Other times it would be pouring down rain, we'd have to be harnessed in, we had our hoods over, just kind of shoveling it in, but we never missed a single breakfast in 41 straight days. It was our opportunity to re-answer that question why, to recommit to one another, which ended up being our why, was for each other. Now we didn't go to each other every morning at 8 a.m. be like, hey, you want to recommit to me today? <laughs> like, it's not a movie. <laughs> that's weird. But, but, but in our hearts and in our minds, that's exactly what was going on. At 8 a.m., we did that. And sometimes we talked about family, business even. Other times we were talking about 
what we were going to need to do these next days. It didn't matter. We had that. And as we started moving up, sat phones, everyone's calling, periodical, New York Times, National Geographic, all these different periodicals and journalists calling. They want to know, right? They want to know the one thing. How are you doing what you're doing? How are you doing this seemingly impossible thing? Now, I think they wanted to hear something superhuman, right? They wanted to hear, oh, we're not even sleeping. We're just rowing 24 hours a day. That's not the case. We were scared and depleted. The real answer is something much less interesting to those journalists, but I hope to be much more interesting to this room, which was this leveraging of human emotion. We leveraged each other in a way that before that first breakfast, scared of everything, scared of dying, the elements, everything. After that first breakfast, more scared of letting each other down than we were of anything else. That is the reality of us going faster. Here's some pictures of us as we cross the finish line. There's thousands of people that came to see this team that had defied what everyone thought was going to happen. Uh, there's me. I'm seeing my wife for the first time. I got married three weeks before this race, by the way. And I'm still married. Now that's cool. Pictures of us at the finish line and when we got on land. And... These are the pictures that I choose to hang up in my office. These are my why. This is how, when I come to work every day, what I want to see. We got medals. Our sponsors gave us a nice watch. Right? But those aren't the things I look at every day. Those are the things. This idea of being able to leverage human emotion is the most powerful tool that we have as human beings at our disposal. It is absolutely 100%. I want to wrap up this story, and then I'm going to show you how it rolled into the world record and, and largely let you watch a, a, a video to see it. But I want, I want to bring this up. I'll read it out loud. And once the storm is over, you won't remember how you made it through, how you managed to survive. You won't even be sure whether the storm is really over. But one thing is certain, when you come out of the storm, you won't be the same person who walked in. That's what this storm's all about. Here's the deal. If... You choose to give everything you have to something, whether it's a job or a client or a project or somebody else. You can also, you are also choosing to be changed by that. You will be different. Tom and I are not the same people that left. We're different now. Right? We are different because we gave everything we had to it. All right? It's also something to note that if you're asking somebody on your team, if you're asking people to give everything that they have, you are asking them to be different when they come out of it. That's what you're actually asking them to do. And people don't want to sometimes, okay? You can have people that punch a clock, all right? You can have nine to fivers. We need them. Individual contributors to a large organization that do a good job, and then they leave, and that's it. But that is not what this room is full about. That is not what these next couple of days are about. It is about this. What you are asking people to do is not a casual thing, and it should not be taken casually. And that is what I learned maybe the most about that first row. One year later, a new team, same place as that first picture, having broken the world record at 35 days, 14 hours, and three minutes. You don't see Tom in there, obviously. I asked him if he wanted to be in. He said, uh, expletive, no. <laughs> Which was fair, I guess. Uh, he became our land manager. I'm not going to be able to tell this story. I don't have the time to tell you. I'm sorry, I, I won't be able to. But I, I do want to tell you how we got to this point. And I'm going to show a video. They made a documentary about this. And I'll show you a short clip of that from that documentary. This is a new team, new people. I got off that boat, as you saw in that, that, uh, the picture. Our sponsors there, Carlisle's a manufacturing firm. Um, CEO was very, very much involved. They flew down um, to see us, did a great job supporting our family and our friends. And the next morning, we're, we have this nice big villa that, that everyone's kind of cramming into. I get up early, and the CEO's kind of on his little laptop there doing some work and um, having some coffee. And I, I get up early, no one else is up. And he says, oh, come and talk to me. And we've become close over these last couple of years. I mean, we, we became very close. He was very involved. And he said, hey, what you did, and Tom did, was amazing. You gave it, because he wanted a story that he could give all of his employees worldwide. That's what he was. He wasn't doing it to get their name on the boat. He wanted to tell stories. He said, boy, did you give us that. 
And as I'm kind of basking in all these nice compliments, he goes, oh, and by the way, I want you to do it again. And I'm like, yo, and I'm 40 pounds light. He's looking at me. I don't even have a shirt on at this point. And I'm upset, you know? I mean, how could you even say that to me? You know, there's only been like 10 people that have ever even tried to attempt this race twice, and it's usually because the first time they didn't even make the crossing. And here he was asking me to do it the very next year, nine months later. And he says, I think I know you pretty well these last couple years. What you did was nothing short of amazing. But we wanted to win and to break a world record. Let's go and finish that unfinished business. I don't think 11th place is going to be good enough for you. That's what he said to me, as only a CEO can say with that kind of confidence. And I have no intention at this point. I'm listening to him, you know, because he gave us money. <laughs> and I have no intention of doing it again. But I get home a week later, and I start putting the weight back on, and I heal, and we're seeing all of our family. And he's right about one thing. I'm doing it again. Because he said, he said, you do it again, you give me a call, and we'll be there to support you. He's right. That call is coming. But he's wrong about the reason why. I'll tell you what. I think I can say this a lot of confidence. That's the best 11th place story you're ever going to hear. <laughs> Mostly because there's not a lot of 11th place stories out there. But I am so proud of what Tom and I accomplished. So proud. It wasn't because of that 11th place. But the thing that I can't get out of my head as I'm back home putting on that weight, healing up, talking to people, recounting all these stories, is Greg. The guy who chose to leave, even though he could have stayed. It was not Nick's fault. Nick was sick. He needed help. Greg could have stayed and he didn't. Let me tell you something, as a leader, it's easy, it'd be easy, on it. it's, it's fun to get down on Greg on this thing, it's fun, look at this. But as a leader, it was my responsibility to be able to leverage his human emotion in a way that made him want to stay. And as a leader, as the captain of that team, I had failed. And that's the reality. If you choose to take leadership roles, if you choose to take people from here to here, that is your burden. That is not theirs. And that is why I called Chris at Carlisle and said, we'll do this again. But I couldn't stop thinking about how Tom and I were able to do this just to ourselves. I said, what about if it wasn't just me and another person leveraging this human emotion? It was me leveraging three other guys. And those guys, in turn, were leveraging me and the other two. I said, why would you even stop there? The boat, the team isn't just the people in the boat. What about our land manager, who now was going to be Tom? What about our friends, our family, the whole organization, the community? What if we were all doing this? So, that's what I did. I started building a team full of guys that wanted to be part of this. And so I started building this. And I'm not going to be able to go through all this, but Angus there on the far right raced against me in that first race. Won the race as the captain of that team, but fell short of the world record that he also wanted by three and a half days. And we became close, and we started talking, and I brought him on. On the left there, Alex Simpson. 24 years old at the time, young, but had rode the Indian Ocean, always wanted to row the Atlantic, was a process guy, process, 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 always wanted to know, how are we going to do in eight months what people have been spending two years training for? And then in the middle, holding that oar, a teammate of mine, an old teammate from the Olympic team, who had just, uh, Matt Brown, who had just tried to represent the United States in the men's single, the hardest rowing race, fell short in the finals and was looking for that, some, that next something greater. And I put this team together no longer assuming everybody wanted what I wanted. I assumed that Greg would do whatever it took, and I was wrong. I was not going to do that. These were full of people, the right people, full of people like Tom's. And then when we went to train, yes, we trained. I live in San Francisco Bay, so you can see us rowing out of the Golden Gate. But what we spent those next nine months largely doing is building that sense of community. I was so convinced that this leveraging of human emotion was what really drives high performance teams that I was willing to literally put our entire reputation on it. And so we got to know each other. If anybody wanted a job, a neighbor, a friend wanted a job, we gave them a job in this campaign that we had. That's how we treated it. And before we knew it, we were back in the Canary Islands ready to start. Now I'm not gonna tell this story, I'm just gonna let this video show it. But I will tell you that it was not any easier. This is us at the start. Matt Brown in the middle, the only guy in the boat that had never rode an ocean before, gets seasick. I can't even make this up. Just like Nick, by day three, is in that same exact cabin, not rowing. Other mistakes, like myself and Angus, who had rowed this race the year before, considered experts at this point, decided to take a southerly route instead of directly for the west, thinking that there's going to be better wind and waves out there in our favor. 
nope. By the time we got 45 miles out of our way, we realized we were getting broadsided by waves. It was worse, getting our teammates sicker and us going slower. In fact, halfway through this race, the team that everyone thought was going to win isn't only not on pace to set a world record, we're not even winning. But as you will see in this video, not a single bad word is spoken. Everybody is there, committed to each other. By New Year's Day, we were in first place. With 500 miles to go, we were ahead of the world record by 24 hours and ahead of the next place team by four days. The storm comes down and hits us on Friday the 13th, and I wasn't uh, superstitious, but now I am, <laughs> and knocks us out of world record pace. We are now, we have to do 80 miles a day. We are now 400 miles left in this race with five days left to go. 80 mile days, just to put in perspective, is impossible. 70 mile days are world record pace. 80 mile days are unheard of. And to string five in a row on the last five days of this race when we're already beat up was just removed from reality. But the response by the team, which you will see in this, film, this video, was nothing less than miraculous. We rode three up, just like this picture on the last day. That means everyone had to row 18 hours on that, on that now five, first day of now five-day race. We did 79 miles, which is okay, but not on, quite on pace. On day two, when anybody in that team could have been justified in taking their foot off the gas just a little bit, just enough because i got to make it through the next four days. We're all beat up so bad. I know that nobody did because on day two, we rode 92 miles. And on day three, we rode 94 miles. And on day four, we rode 88 miles. And we coasted on the last day, breaking the world record by 13 hours. An impossible feat. Oh. All right, before I get choked up, I'm just going to show you the video. There's a little, a little closer. You can see Matt Brown, Angus, Alex. Really very excited. We're very relaxed, we're very positive. And all we've got is 3,000 miles of open ocean for our arrival in Antigua. Of course, nervous, but n being nervous is natural. I'm very fortunate to be doing this with such an amazing team. Looking forward to having a beer and a party at the other side, but for now it's just head down and focus and get rowing. I'm mostly excited about freeing myself from this race. After last year, I felt like it's got a hold on me. And so the, way, the best way to free myself is to have the race that I want to have, that this team and I have all agreed that we want to have. And no matter what happens at the end of it, I'll be free from it. The first week of the race was less than ideal. Mac was seasick basically from stage one. After 24 hours, something started to change and I started, I started feeling a little bit queasy. There were obvious reservations that Matt hadn't spent a lot of time at sea. In my eyes, that screams disaster. He's throwing up, he's disoriented, and I'm thinking, have I made the same mistake as I did last year with Nick? It got worse and worse and worse. You start to think, well, how long can this guy last? This could get really bad. If we've got the guy that we were relying on as being the strongest rower barely pulling through the water, we're in big trouble. Update, this is hard. But the beauty of this team was that I never felt the pressure from them. They knew that at that point, what they needed to do was just kind of nurture me back up to where I needed to be. Jason and Angus pulled together and did a great job at making sure Matt got six hours sleep. Angus and I split his shifts, um, give him some time to eat and then fall asleep. And from that point forward, it's like, yeah, here's, here's the old Matt. He's, he's back, he's getting stronger, and we can, we can feel him pulling now. It coincided at the time where Rover James were equal to us, ahead of us, and behind us, and every stroke, every day, every mile mattered. We went south. History has shown that the better winds are in the south, and we were gonna try to catch those. Rover James decided to go almost due west and take essentially a straight line for the finish line right off the bat. Within a couple days, we were realizing that they were catching much faster wind and waves in much fairer conditions than we were. So the decision was go back up north and meet them on their own grounds because we were fairly certain that we were stronger than them. Us increasing our heading meant we were gonna have to get waves from the side. This meant we had to wear all of wet weather gear and get very wet and that's very detrimental to the body. 
I'm just gonna get my two hours right now and I'm just gonna sleep in my that weather gear. There's no point taking it out. So. so we knew we had to fight and bring come up to them. Making good progress, going to due west as much as possible, just trying to make us some good ground. We were 900 miles in and we were separated by five miles. So we then had to have a big, aggressive move. We brought the fight to them, get onto the last shoot and then smoke them. Rope claims are about five miles that way. This was a race. We are turning into a well-oiled machine. Every session, just crushing more and more miles. Great news this AM. You have cut under and right out in front of road for James. Under two weeks to go, assuming all goes well and on pace for the world record. You really can't ask for anything more. Then, on Friday the 13th, everything went against us. The worst day of our row. Potential headwinds for up to two days, which uh, could completely ruin our hope of getting the world record. All of a sudden, the water felt like you were rowing through cement. We couldn't move the boat. Watching the record drift away. And it just felt like it was God slipping through our hands. Hopefully there's light at the other end of the tunnel. We were so set on that record. Giving up was never an option. We had to average 80 miles a day for the next five days. And if we do that, we may just get the record. That's how close it was. And it's literally coming down to the hour. That's when Jason's leadership came in and he just said, right, here we go. And he set big goals, goals that I thought there's no way you should even, you may be thinking it, but don't say it out loud. We did 79 miles, 92 mile day, 94 mile day. The ocean was throwing everything it had at us and it just, it wasn't enough to break our spirit. So then it turned from chasing a record to how much can we beat this record? The crew was great. We all just came together and we were so driven. At that stage, the camaraderie went up and that's when everyone started to stick their hand up and say, yep, I'll row an extra shift. Matt, Matt was sticking his hand up in five minutes. This guy's starting to just finish his two-hour shift, shovel some food down, and then all of a sudden he just start putting the oars in that third position. And like, what are you doing? He's like, I think I'm just gonna row for another hour. I feel pretty good. I got into this state of turning on beast mode. All of a sudden you see the selflessness be taken to another level. At that time we could not have gone any faster or dug any deeper. And uh, that final day was just beautiful closure on what was the most amazing endeavor that I've ever been part of. But we pushed ourselves to the limit and it made coming to Antigua the best feeling in the world. It's words can't describe that finish line, you know, it's it's just an overload of information. You've been with these three other people who are just who turned into your brothers. That feeling of pulling together, pulling for one another, trying to live up to one another is amazing. We've done something that's rare in today's world. We crossed the ocean in 35 days, 14 hours and three minutes. We won the race, set the world record. I couldn't have picked a better team. I gave you. Thank you. Thanks. I really, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll finish with this. This was the result: 35 days, 14 hours, and three minutes, which is a world record. Certainly, so proud of that um, that result, and of course, what Tom and I did the year before. But the stories, anecdotes that I chose to tell you today, I think, are, are really the message that I wanted to portray here. Um, you heard, you kind of heard Angus say, um, you know, that's when, you know, Jason's leadership, when he started hitting big goals, goals that maybe you, you think, but you don't say out loud. Here's the deal. We build these teams, these organizations, these communities, these companies, and we do what we can for the people that we're leading, not just because we're good people, of course, that is a big part of it, but we do these things because we're, let's not forget we are a for-profit organization, all right? <laughs> Let's not forget that stuff. We need to produce. You do those things so that when you pull out of the cabin, you realize as a captain that you now have to do 80 mile days. You can look your teammates in the eye. You can say that I need nothing less than everything that you have. And they will look you back and they will say, okay. And they'll mean it. You saw that. You heard that. I said, 
the selflessness got taken to another level. Those numbers will never be broken again. And it's not because we're the biggest, strongest athletes in the world. But there was a leveraging of human emotion there in a way that I don't know if I'll ever see that again. I do a race every year, and pretty much I'm just trying to chase that feeling. I'm trying to find that again. I'll leave you with this. If you want something you've never had, you must be willing to do things you've never done. Believe me, Carlisle is, was a fantastic sponsor. But they did not want to hear, like, how are you going to build this team and break it? Oh, I'm going to build a community of people. He's like, no, just get the biggest, strongest people and go out there. You know, we, we want the talent. Talent is important. But I believed in this idea so much that I put my reputation, my company's reputation on the line, and it is not heard of all the time. We talk about it, but it is not practiced and committed the way that it needs to be committed to. And I'll tell you this right now. This is going to sound very audacious, and it is. This year, we're rowing in the Pacific, I alluded to at the beginning of this talk. San Francisco to Hawaii against some really, really great teams. A couple Marines teams, a Royal Marines team, a U.S. Marines team in there. Very strong competitors. But we'll win. We will win. And I say that because that's how much I believe in this. This is all that matters. Without this, you can't do any of the other things that we're talking about. Right? This is what matters. And the last thing I'll say, it's been something that I've been thinking a lot about lately is that you know we hear about um, it's not how many times you get knocked down, it's how many times you get back up. Right? We hear this. This to me, I find a very unproductive cliche. Okay? To be honest with you, no one really cares anymore how many times you get back up. It's true. There is so much talent out there. There are so many people willing to do it better. What we need to do is spend time on the ground figuring out how we got there in the first place, talking about it, so that when we get back up, we are a tougher, smarter target to knock back down. We need to spend time being comfortable talking about not just our successes, but our failures. And I promise you, it will lead to these types of things. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just I want to say a quick personal note. I, Thank you to, to Crawford for inviting me here. Uh, like I said, I do feel part of this family. For the last couple of years, I, I've been able to, been fortunate enough to be at the executive, teaching executive leaders, and this was an important thing for me to come to and be able to speak to. Um, so thank you so much for letting me be part of this, letting me stick around for the next couple of days, which I will be. I'll be here the rest of today and tomorrow. I'm staying because I just want to meet people, shake hands, answer questions, um, have people tell me their stories. Happy to do so. Thank you so much.